On this week's edition of New York Now, Election Day is almost here and it could be a game changer for New York. Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio and Joe Spector from USA Today join me with analysis. Then, it's a huge year for minor parties in New York and for some, this could be the last year you see them. We'll tell you why and discuss with leaders from two of the state's minor parties. Jerry Kassar from the State Conservative Party and Sochi Nemica from the Working Families Party. I'm Dan Clark and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. We are so close to Election Day, and it just feels like everyone's a little on edge, right? And there's good reason for that. This election is really important for a lot of people from both of the state's major parties. It's so important, in fact, that we've already seen more than a million people vote early in New York. That's compared to about 250,000 last year. And some people have waited for hours in line to vote, in bad weather too. That happened across the state, but especially in New York City. Lines wrapped around city blocks at some polling sites, and people had to wait a long time to cast their votes. And now some are calling for changes at the City Board of Elections. Here's Governor Cuomo this week. I think the Board of Elections in New York City did a terrible job. Terrible. Uh, and it's not the first time. And I think uh, I would be open to a entire redesign of the New York City Board of Elections system. Uh, I think the city, I'd be open to whatever the city proposes to just redesign from the ground up uh, the New York City Board of Elections, period. But any changes made to the state's election system will come long after Election Day, and that's going to depend on who wins at the polls. Let's get an Election Day preview from Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio hey. and Joe Spector from USA Today. Thank you both for being here. Glad to be here. So mm -hmm. it is a big election year in New York mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, namely the state Senate and some seats in Congress. I want to go to you first, Karen. What are you watching this year? Well, what I am watching is the Senate Democrats. Are they going to gain any seats? The state Senate Democrats. State Senate, yes. As you, as you might remember, in 2018, they picked up a lot of seats from Republicans. They just need two more to have a super majority. And that's important because they could potentially override any veto that Governor Andrew Cuomo issued. And that could really change the balance of power between the legislature and the governor. Because right now it seems like the governor has all the power. He has all these emergency powers because of the COVID pandemic. He has a lot of powers in the budget, one through uh, court cases from his predecessors. So I think the um, Democrats in the Senate feel like if they could get enough members gang up with the Democrats in the Assembly who have enough members for an override, they could use that leverage in budget negotiations. In the times when they disagree with Cuomo, they don't disagree with him on a lot. Cuomo has actually gone along with a lot of their agenda in the last two years, but I think that that's something that they're hoping they can just have a shift and just gain a little bit of power back, because it doesn't seem like they have a lot right now. And it's funny because it seems like they want that power, but they don't like openly publicly want it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they would ever say in public, like, we want to get a super majority so we can override the veto, but you can definitely tell that it's there. For yeah, them. well, actually, Senator Gianaris, Mike Gianaris of Queens, who's kind of the mastermind of the, of the uh, whole uh, strategy, he did pretty much say that to me. I have to say, I was surprised that he said that outright. He's like, well, you know, it would give us some leverage in cases. So, you know, oh, yeah. he's, he's well, definitely it, you know. openly saying it. Right. That's that's it. You know, I mean, yeah. so for so many years, for a decade or more, it was always you're going into election night with the headline, who will control mm -hmm. the state Senate? Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2008, Democrats were able to win it. Republicans mm -hmm. won it back. Then you had this uh, bifurcated legislature uh, Senate where Republicans were in control with the help of Democrats. Well, you don't have that going into election year. Democrats hold 40 seats, Republicans only hold 23. So the question will be, will they get that supermajority? Will Republicans get a few more seats? But it's not hanging in the balance as it has been for you know a decade or more. So it's really trying to look at where the key seats will be. And to Karen's point, if Democrats get that supermajority, well, what practically will that mean? It'll only mean that when they go into negotiations with Cuomo, they could sort of have that in the back that if, you know, we could override your veto if you don't like what we, you know, if we don't like what you do. So that's hanging there. But nonetheless, you know, you look around the state a little bit, 
case, uh, races on Long Island, Hudson Valley, mm -hmm. the Rochester area, I would say, as well. Mm -hmm. You have nine Republican senators who are retiring. Yeah. So what you're talking about, in most cases, Republicans who have long held seats where there actually might be a Democratic majority of voters, now those long-standing Republicans who are popular, well-known, like Ken Laval on Long Island, John Flanagan, the former uh, majority leader who is not going to be there, Rich Funky up in Rochester, right. Joe Robach, Joe Robach in particular, a Republican who has held a largely Democratic seat that covers a big swath of the city of Rochester. Right. And his you know, family's been there like, what, about 100 years? Well, his, his father, father was the assemblyman, of course. Right? Yeah. So, you know, and so when they've looked at the map over the years, you know, Democrats across the state would say, Joe Robach, look at that seat. That's a Democratic seat. You know, we could easily mm -hmm. win that. But then you got to tell him, wait a minute, Joe Robach is an establishment there. Yeah. You're not yeah. going to be able to beat him. Now he's gone. Rich Funky. So now you put a lot of races in open seats, and that really creates a lot of uncertainty about where, yeah. who's going to hold those come uh, after Election Day. Right, and the Republican candidates, are they're just not as well-known as like a Robach, like you mentioned, or a John Flanagan, or Ken Laval, who had been there for a very long time. So the Republicans have an uphill battle. I think their challenge is to stay relevant. They don't want to go down to 18 or 17 seats. They they still they know they're in the minority, but they still want to be part of things. Right. And I think that's their challenge. Can they win back some seats on Long Island where the Democrats took them in 2018? A number of them are first-term Democrats who aren't as well known as um, you know the Republican predecessors. So that's that's where they're looking to to gain well, some seats. Well, you talk back. about the supermajority, uh, Karen. <clears throat> you know, you have Ron Lauder, the uh, uh, the Estee Lauder heir, who has pumped $5 million into help helping some Republicans in key seats. This is so weird. Why? Well, that's why, the question, right? This? It's not a broad strategy. And so you've heard Democrats say, well, maybe it's being done to prevent Democrats from getting that supermajority. Right. So and, it's a real strange benefit? dynamic that, uh, yeah, you know, you only see in New York. I mean, remember, if you remember, it was Mike Bloomberg when he was mayor who would put a lot of money into set of Republicans to keep them in the majority. But you kind of knew the reason yeah. why there. He was mayor. He had, a, well, he had an interest in keeping them in power. Well, with this one, if you connect the dots, who would benefit by not having a supermajority that might override some vetoes, and that's yeah. some of the rumors is Andrew Cuomo behind it. Although Cuomo, he hasn't acted like he's very worried about it at all. In fact, he's done some fundraisers for, I think, nine different Senate Democrats, uh, and in the past he's you know been criticized for not doing enough. So it, it doesn't seem like he's doing it anything overtly to not have the Democrats win. And this week in particular as well, he did a conference call with members of the Long Island delegation, right. Democrats who, as you said, Joe, are in a very, very tight toss-up races down there on Long Island to announce legislation geared against utility companies, which obviously failed to restore power in a timely manner after Tropical Storm Isaiah. So, and who doesn't hate the downstate utilities, exactly. right? I mean, that's if there's like one thing that we can all gang up against, it's those utility yeah. companies who keep on yeah. raising my bills. Which but that, is interesting in that, you know, flash back a few years ago, Republicans held all nine seats on Long Island, mm -hmm. the Republican nine, as, yeah, as they right. were known mm -hmm. as. Now they're down to two, yeah. you know, and so you go into this election, and it, that's a real battleground. Same for the Hudson Valley. You look at uh, Rob Astorino uh, versus Pete Harkham. Pete Harkham, a, a freshman Democrat mm -hmm. in the Hudson Valley, Westchester, Putnam, and Dutchess, that district covers. So not only do you have Republicans who are retire retiring, but you have Democrats who are freshmen, Mm -hmm. who are going trying to win a second term in, in races that, again, become battleground seats. All right, yeah. before I let you guys go, Karen, I want to talk to you about prisons in New York. There's been this right. huge outbreak at Elmira Correctional mm -hmm. Facility <clears throat> in Elmira. <throat> I looked at the numbers. In early October, it was three inmates that were diagnosed as positive. As of Wednesday of this week, that's the last time I checked, it was close to 600. Yeah, it's like 40% of the inmates. Right, what's happening here? Well, the prisons were largely spared in the, the spring. But I, I don't know, someone described COVID-19 as a wave and it's just gonna keep going and it's gonna hit places, you know, hit New York City, it hit different areas and it's getting into places like the Southern Tier, um, you know, where Elmira is, a couple other prisons that are, well, one other prison that's having trouble there in Southport. And I think that that's, you know, it's getting in there and it's a congregate setting. The governor and his aides, they say they're taking steps. They're gonna try to isolate the older and sicker um, prisoners 
and they're doing testing, they've banned visiting, they're trying to social distance them, but how much can you social distance? Exactly. It's a prison. It's a prison. It's and a congregate setting. How many isolated places can you find in a prison when you have thousands of inmates and hundreds of them have been diagnosed with a disease? It's a question that I think DOCS is going to have to continue asking itself in every facility. So we'll watch it. Uh, Joe Spector from USA Today, Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio. Thank you both so much. Minor parties in New York are facing a new challenge on the ballot this year. Basically, if they don't get enough votes, it's going to be a lot harder for them to get on the ballot in 2022. That's because when Democrats created a new public campaign finance system this year, they raised the number of votes parties need to automatically qualify for the ballot in the next election. So before it was that parties needed 50,000 votes to qualify, now it's 130,000 or more. Some of the state's minor parties are going to have a harder time than others getting enough votes, and that could lose their place on the ballot. We'll speak with one later. But the state conservative party isn't expecting to have a problem, thanks in part to new energy for the party from President Donald Trump. I spoke with conservative party chair Jerry Kassar. Chairman Kassar, thanks so much for being here. Very welcome. So let's talk about this new ballot access problem first. You're one of the minor parties that has to get more votes this year compared to last year to gain automatic ballot access in the next election cycle. But if memory serves, the conservative party has gotten well over the threshold in the past election year. I think in the most recent, in the gubernatorial election, you got more than 200,000 votes, obviously far above the 130,000 threshold. Are you worried at all about the Conservative Party meeting the threshold for automatic ballot access this year? Uh, no, I'm not. The, uh, the actual rule is 130,000 or 2 percent of the total vote that came out for either governor or president, whichever is higher. This year, I would estimate that the required vote is going to be between 160 and 170,000 votes. President Trump got 292,000 votes on our line four years ago. I am anticipating he would do at least as well, particularly with the turnout being anticipated to be maybe 20 percent higher this year versus four years ago. And if that wasn't enough, the conservative party has traditionally run campaigns around their presidential candidate. And we are running one right now. We are spending money asking conservatives and others, of course, to vote on the conservative party line for President Trump. Do you think it was the right decision to raise the ballot threshold for automatic access? Obviously, your party's not going to have a problem, but do you think that it should be easier for minor parties to get on the ballot than it is under the current new tougher law? Well, I mean, I, um, I, th I thought the numbers prior were actually pretty good. I, the, the concept of third parties and minor parties is to give people additional voices. I mean, th there is no real good argument, as far as I'm concerned, to restrict the number of opportunities uh, yeah, a person can have to choose a political party or, or organization that better reflects their views of the world. Um, combined in New York State, those minor parties, so to speak, were getting 18, 20 percent of the total vote. And for the half the Democrats in the state legislature to essentially say, well, that we don't want to see continue uh, using some administerial argument concerning ballot clutter as though uh, the operations of a piece of paper on a machine should stop people's votes seems very anti-American to me. So let's talk about the conservative party in general, because if I'm a voter going to vote on election day or early voting, I might look down the ballot and see President Trump on the Republican line and then President Trump on the conservative line. So if I'm a voter that's trying to decide where to vote for him, why should I choose the conservative line over the Republican line at the polls? Well, we, we, we argue and we all have been arguing that by voting conservative, you're sending a stronger message. The president uh, essentially identifies himself as a conservative. So in New York State, you're giving that opportunity. Um, we certainly want you to vote for him. So we're not going to, you know, if you vote for him on the Republican line, fine with us. But we believe by giving us a, a stronger vote, you are actually accomplishing more because you are sending that message that the conservative party has gotten one of its highest votes ever. And in turn, to the state legislature, local government officials, to the governor, that New York State has a vibrant conservative movement. As you know, the governor on a number of occasions has made it clear he doesn't even want us in the state. We would rather, you know, be, show him that hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers are sending him a message that um, we're here, we're, you know, we're New Yorkers, and just because he disagrees with us is no real right, he has no right 
to try to get rid of us. Some voters might wonder, why have both parties just in general, not even looking at the ballot, but why have the Conservative Party and the Republican Party as separate parties? Why not take your organizing power and your, uh, your candidates, I guess, and all of your organizing and put it behind Republican establishment candidates and try to push them further in the conservative direction? Well, you actually said the answer in it because you called them a Republican establishment candidates. The Conservative Party was founded because of the liberal Republican establishment in the early 60s. Now, that may not be as true today, but we, we believe that we pull um, many good people a little more further over to the right on issues. We do have a social issue agenda that we do talk about. The, uh, sometimes the Republican Party is not as quick to speak about it, but it's meant there's no criticism to the Republican Party. What it does mean, though, is that sometimes we actually run our own candidates on occasion, we do endorse Democratic candidates. I can tell you in Brooklyn, for example, there are a number of state legislators and council, a council member that are endorsed by the Conservative Party. So my, my argument would simply be that um, by the existence of an independent party like the Conservative Party can work as a joint effort through New York State's fusion laws, which allow the votes of two parties to be combined, but it also works as kind of a leverage to cause re, uh, successful Republican candidates and Democratic candidates to move a little bit more in our direction. So you're supporting President Donald Trump this year for re-election, and there's a lot on the ballot, obviously, with the presidency, with Congress, with the Senate, but I'm wondering, just looking at the president and over the last four years, since he announced his campaign in 2015, I feel like the conservative party has had some new energy breathed into it that it may not have had before. What do you see as the president's impact on the conservative party and its future? Because I know that some younger voters may say, well, the conservative party doesn't really have a future, but as we've seen through the president, you really have a new energy happening. Well, I, the president is enormously popular with the conservative party, whether it be on his support of second amendment or his pro-life positions or his economic policies. Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a, there's a lot of good to be said about his foreign policy initiatives. Conservatives are no way, shape or form warmongers. So when, when he started talking about withdrawing troops from Afghanistan, we were pleased with um, his approach. We are clearly uh, America first type political party. So he really speaks our language. Um, I would identify him, you know, there's, on occasion you have presidents that you clearly identify with you. Ronald Reagan would be one that the Conservative Party clearly identified with the party. And uh, President Trump is another one of those presidents. All right, Conservative Party Chair Jerry Kassar, thanks so much for being here. Now on to a party that has a tougher road ahead. The Working Families Party endorsed Andrew Cuomo for governor in 2010 and then again in 2014. And then in 2018, the party decided to put its weight behind Cynthia Nixon for governor instead of Cuomo. And the two things may or may not be related, but less than two years later, the Working Families Party is now finding itself fighting to survive under the new ballot access rules. But they say they're not going anywhere, even if they don't make the ballot. I spoke with Sochi Nemica, director of the State Working Families Party. Sochi, thanks so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Anytime. So the Working Families Party has to get 130,000 votes this year to maintain automatic ballot access, which is basically making it easier for candidates for your party to get on the ballot in the next election cycle. So in other words, if you don't get those votes, it's going to be a lot harder to get the WFP on the ballot in 2022. Are you worried that you're not going to get enough votes to break that 130,000 uh, vote threshold? We're talking to voters up and down the state. And what we're finding is that in this moment of intersecting crises, people are really looking for ways to vote their values and defeat Trump. And so we're seeing New Yorkers who are so clear that we need to stand in a united front against Trump while also communicating that we want fully funded education and good housing and good health care. Voting on the WFP line allows people to have those two messages defeat Trump and build a stronger New York that works for working people. So what happens if you don't get those votes uh, in come November? It, you know, if you don't get that automatic ballot access, the WFP has been really significant in a lot of elections over the last decade here in New York. So what's next for the WFP if you don't get those votes? Is this an end to the party in New York? 
we had a really successful run this primary season, electing leaders like Jamal Bowman and Mondaire Jones and new state leaders, Jabari Brisport, Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, Anna Kellis, up and down the state, which really shows that voters have an appetite for the progressive leadership that we're putting forward. And the party will continue to do that, to recruit and run the most progressive community connected leaders to push for legislative issues that matter to us, like taxing the wealthy in order to fund the programs that working people need across the state, and to ensure that New York State remains a progressive beacon and one that centers the needs, the values, and the visions of working people uh, and the values that we need to stay a strong state uh, for all of us people to thrive here. Some have blamed the whole ballot access kerfuffle on 2018 when the WFP first put their weight behind Cynthia Nixon in the primary for governor instead of the governor. So some people have theorized that the governor, this is kind of like a personal vendetta to get back at the WFP. What do you think about that? Do you think that's what is behind this whole thing or what's the impetus, I guess? Well, while not speaking to anyone's personal motives, it is clear that the progressive movement is growing strong and the Working Families Party was central in uh, putting forward the candidates that defeated the independent democratic conference, right? The turncoat Democrats who uh, cavorted with Republicans and stymied progressive change at the state level. When progressives grow in power, a uh, backlash does ensue. But what we know is that voters want the legislative gains that came out of the Working Families Party successful ca uh, campaign in 2018. Early vote would not have been possible had the IDC slayers not won in 2018. Historic tenant protection, uh, landmark uh, climate change legislation, those are the progressive change that New York voters want and deserve. And that is what the Working Families Party is all about. And we want to continue to do that work. And we will continue to do that work uh, in, ensure, in order to ensure that New York is a state in which all of us can thrive. So let's talk about the Working Families Party in general, because I feel like some voters might go to the ballot in, on uh, Election Day or early voting. They'll see the WFP line and they'll say, well, why is that different than who I'm voting for on the Democrat line. So if I'm a voter that's going to vote, tell me why I might want to vote on the WFP line instead of the Democrat line for reasons other than ballot access, obviously. Yeah, so the first thing is that people should understand we have fusion voting in New York State, which means that the votes that are cast on the Working Families Party line and the votes that are cast on the Democratic Party line for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, get fused or merged together, and which means that a vote to defeat Trump on the Working Families Party line counts exactly the same as a vote to defeat Trump on the Democratic Party line. But what the WFP line communicates is that we want a New York that is accountable to working people. So the WFP for the past 22 years has been pushing an issue agenda uh, that has won. We passed the $15 minimum wage, paid sick leave, an end to the punitive Rockefeller drug laws, um, tenant protections, driver's license for undocumented neighbors. Those are the types of priorities that the Working Families Party has. And so we're saying in a blue state, why can we not actually be the most progressive state and a real beacon for working people in this country? If we want to keep pushing our state forward and therefore pushing the whole country forward in the same direction, we need a robust progressive movement to do that. And the Working Families Party has done that for the past two decades and continues to do so. So voting on that line allows us to, to defeat Trump and build the uh, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers speaking together in unison and saying, we want to ensure that we are all moving forward, uh, that we all recover together out of this crisis, and that we have leadership that's accountable to parents and teachers and students and workers up and down the state. Uh, that is the type of state that we are trying to build. Working Families Party line helps ensure that we continue to do that. Why have both parties? Why not just uh, put your work behind, I don't know, just pushing establishment Democrats to the left, I guess? Why have both parties exist simultaneously? We have to use many tools in our toolbox to ensure that our democracy works for working people. Shifting and shaping the Democratic Party is one of those ways. But we know that many of us are taken for granted in the Democratic Party or don't necessarily see ourselves uh, within any of the two institutions. And we don't want um, the fact that some people feel alienated uh, by the two-party system to mean that people just sit on the sidelines. We need to give people something to vote for, not just to vote against. 
And uh, there are differences between the, our platform and the Democratic Party platform. And so we know that in order to really shape a New York that works for everyone and to focus on structural change issues, we need our own party uh, to center that and to ensure that our values are not disconnected from our plan to win. All right, Sochi Nemeka from the Working Families Party, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Everyone get out to vote and vote on the Working Families Party line. Okay, so a few things to leave you with before we let you go. If you haven't already voted, you can still vote on election day. And if you're not sure who's on the ballot, check the website for your county board of elections. They'll have a sample ballot so you can check the candidates before you go to the polls. And don't forget that if you're voting by absentee, you have to have your ballot postmarked by election day. If you don't want to vote absentee anymore, you can just vote in person. Any questions, head to our website. That's at nynow.org. But until then, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET and by the Dominic Ferrioli Foundation.